So with that, welcome to our World Affairs Fridays. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Zinneman, who is a professor, he's actually the department chair of the Department of History at UC Berkeley. Uh, he has a PhD from Cornell University and a bachelor's from Tufts University. His specialties, of course, are Vietnam and more generally Southeast Asian history. Um, he has numerous awards and professional service and um, most notably, his latest book is The Vietnamese Colonial Republican, The Political Vision of Vu Trang Phuong. So I probably mispronounced that terribly. But um, in order to give us the most time with our distinguished speaker, let me turn it over to Peter so that we can, or Dr. Zinneman, so that we can have um, the uh, longest time here. All right. Okay, Peter is fine. Okay. Hey, I'm, um, I'm older than you, so you know. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be speaking um, to you over Zoom today. Um, excuse um, the bad hair day. It's been more like a bad hair spring, actually. Um, but I see that um, I think I'm not totally alone in that. Um, I want to start by thanking Angela Weck um, for inviting me, um, and especially um, thanking my uncle, Shelley Epstein, um, for helping to set this whole thing up. Um, as Angela said um, in that nice introduction, um, I'm a historian of modern Vietnam, um, and today I'm going to talk about recent changes um, in how historians um, have been thinking and writing about the history of the Vietnam War. Um, and basically, um, what I will suggest or argue very simply um, is that there were once two contending schools of interpretation that dominated the study of the war um, during the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, um, and that these two schools um, have been challenged, and I would argue overtaken um, over the past two decades by two new schools of thought um, that are growing in popularity and authority. Um, everyone can hear me okay? Follow me okay? Yeah? I think so. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to focus in the talk on scholarship written by academic historians and not so much on popular or journalistic writings about the war, which I think um, have remained fairly static, actually, um, as opposed to um, the academic work. Um, in, in fact, I think one of the oddest features of Vietnam War understanding or Vietnam War discourse in the U.S. today is the quite large gap um, that exists um, between scholarly and more popular understandings. Um, this kind of gap exists in a lot of fields, but I think the Vietnam War is something of an extreme case. Um, and I, I think a good illustration of that can be seen by looking at the recent 10-part Ken Burns documentary on the series, um, which um, I'll make you know, a couple comments on towards the end of my talk, but I'm happy to field um, questions about um, as well. Um, but basically, um, as I said, I think there's been sort of two old schools of interpretation about the Vietnam War, um, and those schools are known in the scholarship as, one, the Orthodox School, and two, the Revisionist School. Um, these schools have been around since um, the late 60s, early 70s, um, and they represent two kind of diametrically opposed views um, of the conflict. Let me start by talking a bit about the Orthodox School. Um, who are the Orthodox scholars, and what do they believe? Um, Orthodox uh, scholarship is led um, by critics, essentially, of the American intervention um, who tend to exhibit a kind of left liberal political orientation, uh, you know, also sort of known as doves uh, in terms of their views of the war. Many of these historians were once student protesters against the war during the conflict who became academics afterwards. Um, some are military veterans who joined the peace movement after they were demobilized um, and became professors. Some are journalists um, who were highly critical of the war while it was going on um, and who uh, wrote histories of the conflict after it ended. Um, the school might be said to include histories of the war that are written within the country today by Vietnamese historians, you know, working under the communist government. There's some interesting actually quite significant overlap between what communist historians write about the war and what the members of the Orthodox school write. Um, but there's also some, some differences, but I think it's, it's worth thinking about grouping 
um, that cohort within this category as well. Um, the reason that this school is called Orthodox um, is that it's been the dominant school um, in the historiography. Most historians who teach courses on the Vietnam War in the US are members of, you know, see themselves as members of the school. Most textbooks that are written um, follow the kind of basic um, views um, of the school. This school, I think, is a little bit, um, it emerges a little bit earlier than the other school, um, the, the revisionist school, which is another reason why it's known as Orthodox. Okay, so um, what are um, some of the core beliefs of the Orthodox school? Um, there's one, six things um, here that I want to underline. Um, the first um, is that the main cause of the war, according to scholars in the school, is an extreme irrational American anti-communism um, that emerges in the Cold War um, and which views or tends to view local progressive forces of various stripes in different parts of the world as part of an integrated monolithic global communist movement led by the Soviet Union and China. Um, this form of anti-communism is a central tenant of American foreign policy, um, but it's also a major impulse in domestic policy as well, um, according to scholars of the Orthodox school, um, as manifest in things like the Red Scare and the McCarthyism during the 1950s. Um, this rabid anti-communism, again, according to Orthodox scholars, um, leads the U.S. to misunderstand the nature of its enemy in Vietnam. Um, in particular, it causes the U.S. to view Ho Chi Minh um, and the country or the state that he runs, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, North Vietnam, Communist Vietnam, um, as a puppet of global communist forces based in China and the Soviet Union, something that the Orthodox school thinks is, is incorrect. It also makes American leaders fail to see that Ho Chi Minh's movement is more animated by nationalism and anti-colonialism. Um, in other words, the Orthodox scholars are, argue that the U.S. misunderstands fundamentally Ho Chi Minh's ideology and, and his political project. Um, th this rabid anti-communism also causes Americans to wrongly view Ho Chi Minh um, as committed to the spread of communism to its neighbors. And this is kind of also known as the domino theory, the idea that um, the ambitions of Vietnamese communism go beyond its borders. It hopes to take over neighboring countries or to trigger communist revolutions throughout the region um, where it's located. Um, in addition, um, anti-communist uh, American anti-communism, again, in this interpretation, um, blinds the U.S. to the fact that the Ho Chi Minh government is deeply popular amongst the Vietnamese people, um, and that Ho himself is venerated there as a kind of George Washington type father of the country figure. He's both extremely virtuous um, and uh, extremely competent. And although free and fair elections are never held in Vietnam during the course of the war, had they been held, according to the views of Orthodox scholars, um, Ho Chi Minh wins in a landslide. Um, so these, I'm not sure if you're keeping count, but these first two points um, of the Orthodox school um, really focus on the role of the U.S. Um, as the catalyst for starting the war or American anti-communism as the kind of catalyst for starting the war on the one hand, um, and about the character of Ho Chi Minh and North Vietnam, Communist Vietnam, on the other hand. Um, in addition, um, Orthodox scholars um, hold certain view, views about the southern non-communist Vietnamese state, South Vietnam, or the Republic of Vietnam. Um, and, you know, in short, the Orthodox school tends to see South Vietnam as a puppet of the Americans. The leaders are seen as handpicked by American officials um, and essentially doing the bidding um, of their American advisors. South Vietnamese state in this view are, is seen as an institutional creation of the U.S. Um, the most influential and widely used uh, textbook uh, on the Vietnam War, a book by a scholar named George Herring called America's Longest War. Its chapter on uh, South Vietnam is titled America's offspring. Um, and you can see there's a, a very clear um, indication of that view that South Vietnam is sort of the child um, in some way um, of the Americans. Um, South Vietnamese military um, in this view is seen almost as a kind of mercenary army fighting for American interests in anti-communist um, ideology, not necessarily for the interests of the South Vietnamese people. 
Um, the Orthodox school sees the Southern government as extremely unpopular amongst the population that it governs, and as a result, more or less um, Ill illegitimate. Um, and it, even though, again, there's not elections in South Vietnam, Orthodox scholars suggest that had there been free elections, there are elections, but they're, you know, they're sort of problematic elections, had they been free, um, they would reveal a lack of public support for the government. Um, and the, the Southern government's lack of popularity with its own people originates in this view, not just uh, with, uh, due to its association with the Americans, the fact that it's a puppet or a creature or a child of the Americans, um, but also because of its own incompetence and corruption and, and ineptness. Um, okay, so that's the third view. The fourth view, um, or the fourth point that the Orthodox scholars tend to follow um, it has to do with the character of the guerrilla insurgency in South Vietnam, also known as the Viet Cong um, or the NLF. Um, as most of you, I'm sure, know, Vietnam it gets divided um, in two um, in 1954. Sorry about that. Um, and um, two separate governments um, are established um, in North and South Vietnam. Um, but several years after that, several years after the, these two different states in North and South Vietnam are established, a violent armed insurgency erupts in South Vietnam. And this insurgency does several things. It attacks um, representatives um, of the Southern state. It attacks American presence, advisors initially, but later on it attacks American soldiers. It tries to gain support from the Southern population. Um, it tries to establish uh, independent administration in the Southern rural areas by um, setting up systems to collect taxes and conscript soldiers, meet out justice. It creates a kind of parallel, uh, you know, shadow government um, in, in the South Vietnamese countryside. Um, for the Orthodox school, the cause of this Southern guerrilla insurgency is the unpopularity and illegitimacy of the Southern government. It's bad land policies, it's heavy taxation, it's corruption, it's favoritism, it's nepotism. Um, the Southern insurgency in this view um, emerges in response to local grievances. Um, it's an organic revolutionary movement. It's a natural outgrowth of the illegitimacy and unpopularity um, of the Southern government. Um, and relatedly, the Southern insurgency is seen as more or less independent from Ho Chi Minh's government in the North. It has its own Southern leadership, its own Southern interests, its own local grievances. They may be aligned in some sense with Ho Chi Minh's Northern government, but those are two separate entities pursuing two separate projects. The Orthodox school, this is the fifth, um, my, my fifth view that it holds, um, also has fixed negative views of the American military intervention. Um, basically, the US military is seen as extremely harsh and indiscriminate um, in its use of violence. It causes a huge number of civilian casualties, both through the bombing of North Vietnam and also through kind of um, ham-handed counterinsurgency fighting in South Vietnam. It commits many atrocities and war crimes, murders, massacres, sexual violence, etc. Um, and these acts are not exceptional in the views of Orthodox scholars, but they're a kind of regular and systematic product of the strategy that the Americans pursue and the culture of the military um, at the time. Finally, um, Orthodox scholars argue that the outcome of the war, the, which is the victory of the communist North over the non-communist South and their American allies in 1975, is essentially in, an, in, an inevitable consequence um, of all of these factors um, that I've just mentioned. The popularity of Ho Chi Minh, the competence of his state, um, the unpopularity of the Southern government, the incompetence of its state and its government, the flaws and shortcomings of the American military intervention. The confluence of all these factors means that the outcome of the war is inevitable. There's a strong sense of inevitability in a lot of this scholarship, but it, it implies that sort of no amount of tinkering with strategy or government reform could have changed the outcome. It's a, it's a preordained outcome. If you sort of understand these earlier points, 
um, you um, know from early on that this war was essentially unwinnable from the American or South Vietnamese perspective, and um, that uh, you know there's no kind of uh, you know significant changes that could have altered um, that outcome. Um, so those six points, in my view, uh, you know, are, are fairly commonly held um, in scholarship um, produced by Orthodox um, scholars. Um, what about the revisionist school, this uh, counter school um, that emerges um, a little bit later um, it, as a kind of counterweight to that view? Um, well, first, let me say um, a little bit about who the revisionist scholars are. Um, as you might expect, um, revisionist scholars tend to be led, um, scholarship is led by people who had at some point sort of supported the American intervention, people who might have been considered hawks during the war. Many um, had at one time worked for the U.S. government or for the American military. Um, some were conservative activists during the war um, or kind of culture warriors, sort of anti-war anti protesters, um, people who were turned off by the counter-cultural quality of protest movements against the war in the 60s and 70s. Um, many are strong anti-communists, um, emigres from communist Eastern Europe, for example, um, or strongly anti-communist Catholics. Um, and I would say that many South Vietnamese historians um, who go into exile um, after 1975, um, people who become boat people or leave uh, by various means end up in the U.S. or Canada or Australia, Europe, um, they were historians beforehand, they continue to write history uh, afterwards. Um, the views of the, this cohort aligns with um, a lot of the main points um, put forward by the revisionist school. I think it's worth thinking about clumping them in this category um, as well. Um, so um, what are the core beliefs um, of the revisionists? Um, well, again, there's a handful um, of different things. First off, re re revisionists believe that the war is not caused by American anti-communism, um, but by a kind of relentless determination of Ho Chi Minh to take over a sovereign independent state that gets set up in South Vietnam in 1954. Um, the American intervention, therefore, is not motivated by an irrational anti-communism, but by a desire to protect an independent country from external subversion. Um, revisionists do not necessarily reject the notion that the U.S. is anti-communist, um, but it does challenge the view that its anti-communism is irrational. Um, it sees communism as a genuine threat to countries organized around democratic institutions um, on the one hand and, and free markets um, on the other. Um, <clears throat> some revisionists believe that Vietnamese communists are indeed acting in concert with China and the Soviet Union, or in more extreme cases, that the Vietnamese communists are puppets of those larger communist patrons. Um, but other view, uh, others view the Vietnamese communists as independent as, as you know, independent actors, but as dangerously expansionist themselves. The fall of Cambodia and Laos, two communist movements in 1975 at the end of the Vietnam War, supports the revisionist view that the domino theory actually has some validity, right? The, the domino theory had predicted that if Vietnam fell, you know, all the regional countries would also become communist. Orthodox school says that's ridiculous. The revisionist school says, well, you know, Cambodia and Laos, how do you explain that? Maybe it doesn't go further, but um, that seems to be at least partial supporting evidence for the theory. Um, revisionist scholars in general are not convinced of the popularity of Ho Chi Minh um, amongst um, his population uh, or of his government amongst the population. Um, they tend to see the North Vietnamese government as a totalitarian government, meaning a government that tries to control all aspects of the private life and civil society um, in the country. It emphasizes the fact that there is no independent media in North Vietnam, there's no non-governmental associational life, there's no labor unions, there's no free speech, there's no free enterprise or market economy. Um, and it also says, look, there's no elections, um, and Ho Chi Minh is the subject of a kind of state-sponsored cult of personality that looks a lot like the, the cult of personality that you see with the Kim family in North Korea. Um, and uh, just because uh, Vietnamese children sing songs um, extolling their love for Ho Chi Minh doesn't necessarily mean that they really love him, rather that the government is a kind of communist theocracy, um, and that's um, the way the uh, system is organized and can't really be seen as a reflection of genuine popular sentiment. On the subject of non-communist South Vietnam, the revisionists are more charitable 
um, as you might imagine, than scholars from the Orthodox school. Um, they see South Vietnam as essentially a kind of new post-colonial state that suff suffers from a lot of the same problems, corruption, authoritarianism, as a lot of other new post-colonial states in, in Africa and Asia and, and other parts of the world. Um, but um, unlike North Vietnam, South Vietnam, according to the revisionists, does actually have a kind of imperfect infrastructure of a democratic capitalist society. There are labor unions in South Vietnam. Um, they're repressed by the government. They're kind of, you know, cracked out upon, but they do survive and persist and they remain an actor uh, in the political arena in the South. There are privately owned newspapers and media companies in South Vietnam. Newspapers are censored, but they, you know, find ways to get around censorship. There's a kind of hammer and dance between the government and newspapers um, that doesn't exist in North Vietnam. There are elections in South Vietnam. Um, some are totally rigged, but not all actually. Some are relatively free um, as, as, as far as we understand it. Um, there's a capitalist economy there, and so there's lots of room for private initiative, um, etc. Um, and so revisionist tendency in South Vietnam is, you know, a kind of imperfect struggling democracy, capitalist country waiting to um, develop. Um, moreover, revisionists argue that the leaders of South Vietnam are not all hand-picked puppets of the Americans. Um, in particular, um, they argue that the first prime minister of South Vietnam, a guy named Ngo Dinh Diem, that's D-I-E-M, Diem, um, was a very independent figure um, who comes to power against the wishes of the Americans, who pursues his own policies that reflect his own political interests, um, and the interests that he perceives um, are held by his people. Um, that he has his own nationalist ideology, and that far from being a puppet of the Americans, he's bickering with them constantly, and that he's ultimately deposed about three weeks before Kennedy is shot in 70, in 63, um, as a result of his, you know, nonstop fighting with the Americans. Um, on the question um, of the Southern guerrilla insurgency, the Viet Cong, um, if you remember, the Orthodox school sees that as a, this sort of organic, revolutionary, independent movement. Revisionists have a totally different view. Um, to them, the insurgency is created by North Vietnam and implanted into the South in order to subvert the government so as to soften it up for Northern conquest. The insurgency, according to this view, is supplied by the North, armed by the North, provided strategic direction by the North. It's not indigenous to Southern society at all, but it's external to it. Um, and obviously this conflict amongst historians mirrors one of the most contentious issues during the war itself. Um, you know, what is the origins and the nature of the Viet Cong? Um, you know, your answer to that question during the war to a large extent would determine, you know, whether you were a dove um, or a hawk. On the American military, um, and the question of the American military, revisionists don't deny that the U.S. military um, does some bad things in Vietnam, but these episodes are seen as exceptional and not systematic. Um, also, revisionists tend to emphasize the success of American forces on the battlefield, um, and they argue that the American defeat is not because of the counterproductive character of U.S. military operations, but because of political considerations um, over which the American military has no control, essentially political leadership and political opinion in the U.S. Uh, stopped supporting the war. And that's, um, so if, if, it had, if that support had been maintained, the military would have, would have been able to do its job effectively. Um, finally, um, revisionists have a totally different understanding of the outcome of the conflict. It's not inevitable, and tinkering could have made a difference, tinkering with policy. Um, it's the outcome of the war is not a reflection of the popularity of Ho Chi Minh and his government. It's more related to the ruthlessness of that government and, and to its willingness to absorb massive amounts of casualties and to kill many of its fraternal countrymen in order to win the war. Um, most revisionists believe that the outcome of the war was determined by the nature of American politics and society in the late 60s and early 70s, domestic unrest in the U.S., over the war decreases support for it in the government. The Watergate crisis weakens President Nixon's ability to continue to fight the war. Um, the U.S. media is a very common target of revisionist historians. They argue that the media misrepresented the war, painting an overly gloomy picture of um, progress and encouraging support for withdrawal. Um, there's also a school of revisionist thought 
that argues that the outcome of the war was a function of the fact that totalitarian societies like North Vietnam are superior at waging war over democratic or quasi-democratic ones um, or authoritarian ones like South Vietnam. They don't have to worry about public opinion. They don't have to worry about the impact of domestic politics on war policy. Um, so that's the kind of, um, uh, you know, a variant um, of, of the school. Um, okay, so those are, are the two major schools that sort of dominate scholarship and historical writing, professional, you know, writing by professional historians, I would say from the 70s, um, 80s, and 90s. And as you can see, those two schools really parallel, right, or map onto um, the big fault line in the U.S. during the course of the war um, over whether it's right or wrong, with the Orthodox schools sort of expressing the views and representing a kind of carry forward um, of the views of doves and the revisionist school um, representing a kind of carry forward of, of the views um, of hawks. Um, however, um, over the last 20 years, I would say, two decades maybe, um, um, these two new schools um, have emerged. Um, one uh, I would label the Vietnam-centric school, the Vietnam-centric school, and the second is something that I call neo-revisionism, but I may be the only one who calls it that, um, but I'll explain to you what I mean by that um, in a second. Um, but let me now just, you know, I'll briefly talk about these two schools um, and end it, um, and we can start to uh, take questions. Um, so um, the Vietnam-centric school is a school that um, uh, is not directly antagonistic um, to the orthodox or revisionist school. It sort of agrees with some views of each of the two schools and disagrees with other views. Um, so it's not sort of directly in conflict with them, but it takes a kind of different angle of vision on how the war should be studied and understood in general. Um, it's dominated, I think, by two groups of people. Um, one, uh, people who were born too late to remember the war, um, and I would actually include myself in that category. I'm born in 1965, I was 10 when the war ended, don't really have any memory of, of the war or of its politics. Um, and there's also a very large role in this school played by a new cohort of overseas Vietnamese historians based in the US, in Australia, in Europe, and in Canada. Um, um, and, um, you know, these are young people who were, you know, their, their parents were refugees, they went to graduate school, they decided to study the history of their, this conflict that, uh, you know, shaped their parents' lives so much. Um, and, you know, as you might expect, they have very, they bring a very different kind of personal politics um, and a set of personal experiences, family connections to the war. Um, their families have a very different stake in the war um, than either orthodox or revisionist scholars um, from the earlier generations. One other um, characteristic of scholars in this cohort um, of this new Vietnam Century School is that they, have, they tend to have very good language skills. The Vietnamese Americans, uh, obviously, many of them are you know, bilingual in, in English and Vietnamese, and many of the non-Vietnamese Americans, you know, spend 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 a lot of time learning languages, uh, uh, learning the relevant local languages as opposed to um, members of the earlier generations. Um, and this new language ability that they have um, coincides with the opening of source material about the war in Vietnam itself, that starts in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Um, after the Vietnam War, as, uh, as many people might know, Vietnam kind of closes down to the outside world. It's, it's, you can't really go there, even as a tourist, between 1975 and 1986. Um, but um, as a result of sort of perestroika-esque um, reforms that are introduced in the late in the late 80s, um, we have a uh, you know sort of Chinese-style opening in Vietnam's economy um, and also in its civil society. And what it means is that by the uh, early 90s. As a historian, you can go to Vietnam, you can get into the archives, you can get into the libraries, you can do oral histories, you can talk to people. Um, so a, a wide range of sources, you know, really critical sources, um, to try to understand this event that are available to you that hadn't been available to um, the generation that's working um, in the decade after the war. And actually, I don't think is that available to the generation that's working during the war. You know, the, the conditions of war um, and of communism in North Vietnam are not very hospitable to for, for foreign researchers. It's dangerous. It's a lot of things are closed to them. 
Um, so the v Vietnam centric scholars um, have this sort of new um, trove of material um, to pick over. Um, and this, um, I think, is you know one of the factors that explains um, their different take on the war. Um, so, what are the views um, of this school? Well, um, as the name would uh, allow you to predict, um, the uh, Vietnam scholars of the Vietnam Century School argue that the Vietnam War has much deeper roots in Vietnamese history than either Orthodox or revisionist scholars. Um, one thing they argue is that the political conflict at the center, at the heart of the Vietnam War, is not a product of the global Cold War, and it's not even something that originates after World War II, but that it has its roots in a much earlier local Vietnamese political conflict between competing anti-colonial, anti-French forces um, that emerges during the interwar period. Basically, what uh, Vietnam-centric historians say is that if you look at the, the last decades of the French colonial era, you see the emergence of sort of two different kinds of anti-colonialism, a communist anti-colonialism that's led by a young Ho Chi Minh and a very powerful non-communist or in many cases a kind of anti-communist nationalist anti-colonialism um, that is um, sort of equally dynamic um, and that uh, spends its time both resisting French colonialism, but also fighting against its communist rival. Um, and uh, a lot of the scholarship uh, that, that uh, looks at this issue sort of looks at communist, anti-communist fighting in Vietnam in the 1920s and 30s as a kind of uh, precursor um, and, uh, you know, sort of bedrock um, for um, the conflict that comes to be known as the Vietnam War in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, Vietnam century scholars also uh, argue that the regional dynamic of the conflict, the fact that it's a conflict between two different parts of the country, North and South, is also a much older, or reflects a much older kind of conflict or a much older dynamic within Vietnamese history. Um, you know, both Orthodox and revisionist scholars say, hey, you know, Vietnam is divided in 1954. That's why we see these two different um, uh, forces, regional forces, only because of the Geneva Convention and Geneva Accords of 54. But um, Vietnam centric scholars say, well, if you actually go back to the 16th century, you'll see that there's two different kind of political systems that emerge in the country during that period. There's two different houses that fight a kind of long, 300 year long civil war between the 1600s and the early uh, 1800s. Um, and um, that uh, there's qualities of Northern political culture and Southern political culture that evolve over this 200, 300 year period um, that is then further expressed um, in the conflict of the 1950s, 60s and 70s. It was hardened by that earlier history. Um, and so if you really wanna understand the intensity of the conflict, it's um, you know, why it seems so difficult to solve, um, you have to go back to this, um, you know, sort of old, early modern uh, kind of Vietnamese um, history um, that dates to this, this earlier period. Um, another uh, view, and I would say probably the most um, critical uh, view or the most defining view um, of the Vietnam centric scholars um, is that Vietnamese um, are not secondary characters um, in this conflict, um, but should be seen as primary actors. Um, essentially, what the Vietnam centric scholars argue is that the Vietnamese, Vietnamese people have much, much more at stake in this conflict than the Americans who tend to be at the center of the histories written by both Orthodox and revisionist scholars. Vietnam centric scholars point out that Many, many more Vietnamese lose their lives um, as a result of the conflict. There's, you know, when it, it's, numbers are very sketchy, but we think maybe one to three million Vietnamese dies as a result of the conflict. Compare that to the 58,000 Americans, you know, it's exponentially greater. Um, the Vietnamese bear the burden of the conflict for a much longer duration than Americans. Americans tend to, American soldiers tend to serve about a year um, and then cycle out of the country. Um, whereas most Vietnamese who were born between 
World War II, um, and were born after World War II, they lived with the conflict for 30 uninterrupted years from 1946 to 1975. Um, there's many, many, many more civilian casualties on the Vietnamese side than the American side. There's some, but you know, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the massive number of women and children, non-combatants on the Vietnamese side who um, suffer um, uh, you know, collateral damage um, as a result of the conflict. Um, Vietnam suffers exponentially greater amounts of social dislocation. It's estimated that maybe 30% of the population is internally displaced in South Vietnam during the war. I don't think there's a single American that's internally displaced as a result of the Vietnam War. You don't see American refugees, but it's a huge amount of the population in South Vietnam becomes refugees. Large percentage of the housing stock is destroyed as a result of the war. Um, and of course, there's much greater um, ecological and economic damage in Vietnam as a result of um, defoliants being used and of bombing, et cetera, in South Vietnam. And, and um, a, uh, you know, this kind of ecological consequence of the war. It's, it's a big area of study these days. There's not really, an, there's not much of an American story. It's just really a Vietnamese story. Um, and um, finally, the Vietnamese society suffers the after effects of the war in a much kind of harsher way than the United States. And the United States, we're used to thinking of something called, you know, the Vietnam syndrome um, that affects, you know, American foreign policy or, you know, the impact of the war on veterans, post-traumatic stress syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but given how much more damaging the war is in Vietnam and how much longer it lasts, you can imagine that people who begin to study the post-war impact of the war or the impact of the war in the post-war era, in Vietnam, it's much, much, um, you know, it's much, much harsher. Um, just to take one example, um, so many men are killed, so many Vietnamese men are killed during the war that the post-war period uh, witnesses this great uh, gender imbalance. And so there's a lot more women than men, and so the marriage market is all messed up. Um, and you know, men can more, much more easily find wives than wives can than women can find husbands, and this leads to all kinds of exacerbated gender uh, inequities. Um, the victorious northern government also pursues a relatively vengeful policy against the defeated its defeated southern enemies. Um, you know, leads to up, up, up to a million people being put in uh, re-education camps for, you know, quite long periods of time with the boat people phenomena. Um, so, you know, by um, the sort of standards of the impact of the war in the post-war period, Vietnam it bears, even though in the U.S. We, we sort of have this story of the post-war impact, in Vietnam it's much, much more significant. Um, so given this, um, what the Vietnam-centric scholars argue is that there's something a little bit perverse in both the orthodox and the revisionist scholarship on the, uh, the, in this focus on the American experience. Um, that there's some, you know, historians today, you know, you couldn't write a history of slavery, of American slavery, that didn't put African Americans at the center of that story as the major actors. Just, you know, it would be seen as a sort of unethical uh, act in terms of the narrative that you write. Um, or you couldn't write a history of the Holocaust that didn't put European Jews at the center. You could talk about other actors, but if American Jews were absent or were really um, um, decentered sorry to use the academic jargon, it would be seen as wrong, it would be seen as immoral. Um, Vietnam-centric scholars are now making that argument about the Vietnam War, that Vietnamese for moral reasons, for ethical reasons, should be at the center of the story. They, they had the most at stake, they suffered the most, um, uh, and they are sort of the biggest victims. Um, but uh, Vietnam-centric scholars don't only make this moral case, but they also make it what you might think of as a kind of intellectual case. Um, they say that it's not just that it's wrong to always put Americans at the center of the story, um, but you can't really understand the outcome of the war um, and its evolution without looking at the decision-making and the character of the Vietnamese actors, that the policies of these governments, the South Vietnamese government, the North Vietnamese government, the personalities of Vietnamese politicians, the relationship between uh, South Vietnamese population and its government and the North Vietnamese population and its government, um, the ability of the Northern government, for example, to mobilize uh, and motivate its population to fight with, you know, huge casualties for such a long period of time. You can't really understand the outcome of the war unless you can get a bead on some of those questions. That if you only look at Americans' mistakes, U.S. misunderstandings, et cetera, et cetera, this huge 
um, and really relevant uh, arena of the history is neglected and you're sort of left with sort of one side of the story um, that ultimately um, is um, inadequate in terms of providing a full understanding um, or explanation. Um, a couple of other things about the Vietnam centric scholarship. Um, and I'll try to wrap this up. I realize I'm sort of going on longer than I planned. Um, the Vietnam centric scholarship is a very different tone than either orthodox or revisionist. It's a little bit more tragic, I would say, in its tone and less partisan. Both sides are seen as being at fault. There's a little bit less moralizing in the Vietnam centric scholarship and it's a little bit more even handed. Um, and lastly, Vietnam centric scholarship has no trouble combining a modeled series of positions taken from both the orthodox and revisionist views into its own agenda. So the orthodox and revisionist schools, you know, they've got sort of a menu of positions that they each sort of hold to. And if you believe in one, you believe in all. Whereas Vietnam centric scholars say, ah, we can sort of pick and choose, you know, things that are seen as um, contradictory or issues that are seen as contradictory, they actually might all be part of the same uh, menu of, of beliefs. Um, and this then brings me to this last school, which I'm going to just mention very quickly um, so that we have some time for um, questions. Um, that is what I call the, the um, neo revisionist school. Basically, the, the neo revisionist school um, is a sort of a new impulse or a new orientation um, in the scholarship. Um, that um, essentially agrees with the orthodox school about one big thing, one big topic in the history of the war, and disagrees with the orthodox school about everything else. The one big thing it agrees with uh, the orthodox school on is its view of the American intervention. Neo-revisionists agree with the orthodox scholars that the American intervention was a disaster, it was um, counterproductive. It was, you know, arguably criminal. If you look at all the in, sort of indiscriminate killing of civilians, uh, neo revisionists take a very, very harsh view of the American intervention, um, as harsh as you know dovish, orthodox anti-war historians. But um, neo revisionist scholars disagree very firmly with the orthodox school's interpretation of all of the Vietnamese sides, the three major Vietnamese sides of the conflict: communist North Vietnam non-communist South Vietnam and the Southern Vietnamese insurgency. Essentially, the neo-revisionists say American intervention was bad, but the DRV, communist Vietnam, was a totalitarian state that was relentlessly committed to overthrowing uh, this um, independent government in the South. It was a totalitarian state. It was a very un unlovely state, nothing virtuous or heroic or nationalist about it. It's a, a kind of tough-minded, ruthless, totalitarian state. Um, neo revisionists uh, look at the Southern Republic of Vietnam and they say, hey, this is a relative, this isn't a horrible, corrupt uh, American offspring, that it's, you know, it's kind of struggling uh, post-colonial state. It's got its own agenda that's relatively virtuous, worth supporting. Um, and, um, the, the, you know, the population has its own anti-communist sentiment and that is reflected in the government, needs to be um, taken seriously. Um, and neo revisionists see the Southern insurgency as the offspring of the Politburo in the Communist North, as a as the as a as a puppet essentially um, of the North, um, and not as um, an organic revolutionary movement. Um, and um, neo revisionists, uh, you know, have uh, benefited from the opening of these archives and the opening of Vietnam for research. Um, to find uh, source material um, that supports this sort of modeled picture, a picture of American uh, intervention, a negative picture of American intervention on the one hand, and this uh, counterintuitive uh, picture of the three Vietnamese sides on the other. Um, and the new revisionists in general are not uncomfortable holding this mixed range of views. In fact, they argue that their position is more usefully, is more useful, I'm sorry, um, politically um, for folks who are, say, let's say, opposed to American military intervention in other times and places, they, what they say is that, you know, it's, it's easy to argue against American intervention in Vietnam if you mischaracterize America's allies 
as corrupt puppets and its enemies as virtuous freedom fighters, um, it's much harder actually to make the case um, against American intervention if you accept that um, South Vietnam is you know, a relatively good cause and North Vietnam is a relatively aggressive belligerent. Um, um, but despite that, um, the US still shouldn't get involved because it's only likely to make things worse, doesn't really have the proper instruments um, to win a war um, of this character. Um, and so it's a harder argument to make, the neo-revisionist argument, but ultimately it's got more utility, I guess, um, if you want to use it as a kind of lesson um, going, going forward. Um, in my own personal view, um, you know, Vietnam-centric neo-revisionism, realize that that is a mouthful, um, is um, the wave of the future. And I think it's basically a good thing um, but um, as I said at the beginning of my talk, unfortunately, um, it's up until this point been confined largely to kind of academic scholarship. Um, and, you know, most of, I think, the really talented young historians of Vietnam um, and the Vietnam War work within this vein today. But if you were to watch the Ken Burns documentary, right, this 10 part documentary, um, that was viewed by 40 million people and, you know, is incredibly influential in terms of um, shaping how people um, in the country are viewing the war today. Um, you actually see very little of either of these things. Ken Burns' documentary is a relatively orthodox, U.S.-centric view of the war. It portrays the South Vietnamese state as in very negative light. It sees the Southern insurgency as, you know, sort of organic movement. It, it only um, departs from the Orthodox view, I think, in its, its view of the communist North, which is more critical than typical Orthodox schools. So there is a little bit of uh, adjustment or, um, you know, give on that issue. Um, but it still sort of portrays Ho Chi Minh as this great kind of heroic figure. Um, and I think its biggest sin um, is its really kind of relentless um, U.S. centrism and marginalization um, of, of Vietnamese. Um, and I, I've written, recently wrote a piece about that um, documentary for which I hired a couple of um, graduate researchers to watch this documentary with a stopwatch and try to figure out how much attention is devoted to the, to the different sides and you know, how many talking heads were, are there and what's the qualitative treatment of Vietnamese Americans. And what this research finds is you know, the, the, that temporary documentary, about 80% of it is focused on the Americans, American talking heads, American stories, American um, sort of American side of the conflict and maybe 20% uh, focuses on the other, all the other Vietnamese sides. Um, these researchers then actually, I had them compare this with the last great uh, multi-part documentary about the Vietnam War produced in the U.S. that was done at a WGBH in Boston in the early 1980s, uh, Vietnam Television History. People may be familiar with that. Vietnam Television History is actually more Vietnam-centric, it's actually better than Burns um, by quite a significant margin. Um, and is, I think, in many ways, a more complicated and interesting um, uh, account uh, than, than the Burns film. Um, Okay, sorry I went on a little bit longer than I planned, but there's still 10 minutes for questions, so I'm happy yeah, I'm to. I'm gonna lump a couple of questions together. So the sure. first two questions I'm gonna put together um, are more about the experience during the war. Uh, one of our uh, participants um, notes that he was an enlisted fellow during the war and that while US command almost never knew when the attacks were going to happen, the girls in the bar did. Um, and then the second one is uh, about PTSD from the experience of, of soldiers again during that Vietnam conflict. Um, mm. Do you have any? Do you have any insights on those kinds of things? Um, you know, they. I mean, I I'm familiar with both of those. Uh, the I, and the first question, you know, bar girls. That's a really common um, theme, I guess in the portrayal of Vietnamese in the old Orthodox and revisionist scholarship. You know, I'm saying they're, they're not, Vietnamese are not there that much. They're kind of secondary players, but when they are there, especially when women are there, they are, they, there's a focus on prostitution and bar girls, which of course was a problem. Um, but, um, you know, there's, it's, it's not, um, 
the, the, the number of prostitutes and bar girls and the um, experience of being a, a prostitute and a bar girl was much more, um, well, it was different um, than how it, it gets generally portrayed. And um, I, I'll just give you one example. There's oh, I don't, let me, let me stop you because I don't think that was the point of his question. I think the point of his question was that they were warning the U.S. soldiers before the hits would happen. Um, uh -huh. does, that, does that imply that they um, liked to have the U.S. soldiers there or? Yeah, um, actually, my, what I was going to say dovetails with that. Um, in, bar girls, are, they're often descri described as being, you know, um, well, Viet, undercover Viet Cong guerrillas or um, deeply, um, you know, unhappy in their lot. And of course, a lot of them are. Um, but there's been recent um, oral historical research with ex-bar girls who now live in California and, and places like that um, and discovered that, you know, as you might think, bar, as you might expect, bar girls are actually a very complicated group. Um, a lot of them look back fondly on their period as bar girls, as a period when they were kind of independent working women. Um, and there, of course, there's other, um, you know, there's other bad aspects of their life as well. Um, but um, yeah, I think my answer is uh, it's difficult to generalize. Yeah, you know, there's, I'm, I'm sure what um, this, this gentleman reports occurred, um, but there's a, a much wider range of experience of what it meant to be a bar girl um, during the period. Um, and I'm sorry, the second question was about um, PTSD. Uh, PTSD. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's a well-documented phenomenon that a lot of soldiers um, came back and suffered from PTSD. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that, aware of that work. Do you think it changed our views of PTSD today, especially with soldiers coming back from Iraq or Afghanistan? Yeah, I mean, I think PTSD uh, as a concept really only emerges after the end of the war and replaces um, earlier, uh, you know, less medically induced ideas, uh, things like shell shock, um, which had dominated thinking um, about uh, the impact of war. Um, uh, in, in earlier conflicts. Um, so yes, the, the, the term and its medic, the medicalization of the concept um, has its origins in that conflict and carries on into the, um, in, 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 you know, Iraq and subsequent wars as well. Okay, another couple of questions I think I can put together here. Um, Eisenhower warned about the military industrial complex becoming such a factor driving U.S. policy. And another one of our participants notes that the U.S. military developed um, capabilities, new capabilities, because of the experiences in Vietnam. Do you think those two things are tied together? Do you think our drive to create a better military drove us to see how good it was and test out some things in Vietnam? Um, well, you know, David Petraeus, you know, famously was, uh, uh, you know, a, a commander um, in the Vietnam War, and he writes a, a dissertation later about um, you know, how to uh, effectively fight a counterinsurgency war based on his experience in Vietnam. He then applies that blueprint um, to Iraq. Um, and a lot of people credit um, the successful, uh, you know, consequences of the surge during the later stages of the Iraq war with Petraeus's certain sensitivities and tactics um, that he develops um, out of the negative Vietnam experience. And I'm, I'm, not, not, I'm not sure if that's true, but that is a, a common view. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I, but on the other hand, you know, you see at the beginning of the Iraq war, a lot of similar kinds of mistakes being made um, in, in the early Vietnam war. Um, and, you know, so are those lessons learned through the, the early setbacks of the Iraq war or, or do they, um, come from this uh, early, earlier Vietnam experience. I think it's you know it's it's a tricky it's a tricky question. Yeah, and then counter to that, um, Iraq of course is largely a, a desert area, or mm -hmm. certainly more arid. Um, for Vietnam, it was you know jungle warfare. Um, the the growth of the Navy SEALs and use of Navy SEALs, um, undersea warfare, river mm -hmm. warfare. Um, did we learn from those or have we have we new technologies that go with that? Um, you know, again, I would say that um, it's, a, it's sort of a stereotype 
um, of the Vietnam War that it's it's all jungle warfare. Of course, jungle warfare is a big part of it, but it's actually um, you know there's sort of mixed fighting in the Vietnam War, both urban and rural. The Tet Offensive, the biggest battle of the war, is essentially a, a, this huge urban um, this huge urban battle. Um, and I'm I'm actually not sure if uh, you know le less lessons about uh, jungle warfare or counterinsurgency warfare from Vietnam uh, it, it, as you know connected to that geographical dynamic um, are, um, are are learned later on. There's one thing that I think is really uh, uh, a sort of misunderstanding. Um, in a lot of the existing scholarship is that, you know, the Americans go into this jungle and they're very, uh, um, they're not at home there. Um, whereas their enemies, North Vietnamese soldiers, that's their territory, that's their homeland. They know it like the back of their hands, that gives them an advantage. But Vietnamese actually don't live in the jungle um, and they're not comfortable in the jungle. They view the jungle as a place that's full of ghosts and spirits and um, there's, you know, a lot of anxiety about the jungle, um, and especially in the later stages of the war, when most of the fighting on the communist side is being done by regular North Vietnamese troops, these guys are as uncomfortable in the jungle, you know, sleeping in hammocks and, um, you know, living in tunnels, etc., as the Americans are. And so, you know, again, one, this one sort of common quick and dirty explanation for the outcome of the war, oh, the Vietnamese, you know, were comfortable in the landscape and the Americans were not. I actually don't think that's true. Okay, very good. That's an interesting comment. And I think I'll, this last one here um, will take us to the end of our time. So we seem to have a better relationship with Vietnam today. Um, has any of the historical views dominated our move to a better relationship? Um, has the, has the our better relationship? Um, I mean, I think that if you look at uh, how relations between the U.S. and Vietnam were normalized in the 1990s, um, it was the normalization was spearheaded by veterans of the war, people like John McCain and John Kerry, um, and they um, were able to use sort of leverage their experience um, in the war and their credibility as veterans to argue that the U.S. should, um, you know, make friends again with this communist state. Um, so in that sense, um, I think uh, it, it, th that history was something that helped to, to begin, uh, you know, what's be become a very, you know, quite close relationship actually between the United States and Vietnam. Um, but, you know, I think more significant than the history of the two countries is the dynamic of both countries' relationship with China. Um, where, you know, the U.S. sees China now as its biggest global antagonist. Um, and Vietnam it has a long history of being very suspicious of China. It's a big, scary neighbor. Um, and so a, a lot of the closeness of U.S.-Vietnam relations today um, is because of um, this shared sense of, sh of shared enemy. Um, and that's something that I think transcends um, the Vietnam War. Interesting perspective. Good. All right, last one actually, so we have one minute. As a Vietnam veteran, I wonder if you believe we would have been successful had we gone into North Vietnam earlier. And my biggest regret, especially after returning to Vietnam a year ago, is the feeling we let the South down. They still appreciate us. Mm -hmm. What do you think about tactics, going North earlier? Um, yeah, to, I, I agree with the second part of the question. I do think that the U.S. Lead, lets South Vietnam down. I think the abandonment of South Vietnam is, is a really disgraceful, Thing, you know, the way that it was done in particular. Um, you know, whether an earlier invasion of North Vietnam would have turned the tide, it, you know, it's hard to say. It's pretty clear that the, the a reason why that move was not made was understandable fears that it would trigger a bigger Chinese um, intervention on the North Vietnamese side. We already know that there's several hundred thousand Chinese uh, workers and support personnel in North Vietnam, they're helping to run anti-aircraft systems, et cetera. Um, you know, there's an earlier experience from the Korean War where an uh, Amer American move like that triggers massive uh, incursion of Chinese ground troops. So Americans, you know, it's easy to say, well, had we done that early, um, things would have been different. But 
Had we done that earlier, it could have triggered, uh, you know, cons un unforeseen consequences that could have, you know, added a whole nother dimension and made the conflict even stickier um, and, and more destructive and more difficult um, than it ultimately was. Thank you. Well, I, I speak for everyone and thanking you for this very stimulating discussion of the Vietnam War and our current relationship today. So on behalf of the Peoria Area World Affairs Council, thank you very much for joining us, Professor Vinneman, UC Berkeley, Professor of History and Department Chair. So um, any last comments from you, Professor Vinneman? Yes, thanks very much, Angela. I really had fun, really appreciated um, people um, listening. And um, again, thanks to um, my uncle um, and my aunt um, for um, making it happen and for, for being there. Um, yeah. And, Hi to my parents. I'll, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> All right. And remember, everyone, if you're not a member yet, be sure you go to the website and join today. You won't want to miss all of our upcoming events. Have a terrific weekend. It's supposed to be fabulous weather. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye now. See you, Pete. See you, Shelly. <laughs> Thank you. Care, Pete.